name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. At the conclusion of the last episode, we left the Karayan in low Kerbin orbit, needing to make a rendezvous with the Kerbin space station. We'll get to that in just a second, but uh, I had time for another launch here, so this is the Kerstock doing a rather inefficient roll here. I really need to put some decent control surfaces uh, on the uh, on those boosters if I'm going to do these 180 degree rolls. But anyway, the reason why it's doing this great big giant roll is because it's going into a polar orbit and that's the reason why it actually has three boosters on it. Normally the Kerstock only has two boosters on it, but the third booster gives it what it needs to get into this polar orbit. And the reason for the polar orbit well, I do have a contract, but the contract's actually just to go into an orbit to take this tourist. What's her name? The tourist. Tillian. Tillian. That's a very spacey sounding name. I think it reminds me of Trillian from the Hitchhiker's Guide. Tillian. I wish I would keep her, but she's only a tourist, so she's going to be gone after this. That's too bad. Uh, but anyway, I just need to go into an orbit for her. So the polar orbit is because I have one biome, just a single biome, that I've yet to do a low space EV a over and that biome is the polar ice cap so I got Luya along for the ride our, one of our scientists and she is going to uh, do that EVA and then we're just simply going to get them down right away once the filth, once the EVA is done and the contracts filled get them back down very boring mission but I thought you know while we're watching this ascent why don't we talk about what's coming up in this video? Like I mentioned, the Karayan's in low Kerbin orbit. It's got a uh, rendezvous to do in about a day or so. Uh, and it only has, if you recall, about 11 meters per second of liquid fuel and oxidizer left in the tank, but quite a lot of monopropellant. So we're gonna see if we can get that, uh, that ship over to Kerbin Station. Um, what else do we got coming up? Well, we got to prep the Karine for its next mission, which is going to be to take the lander out to Minmus, and that's going to require some crew rotation, so we'll be doing that. Um, we Duna 1. Duna 1 is scheduled to be doing its burn. That will get it to intercept with Duna, well, sometime in the distant future, not anytime soon, but pretty soon it will hopefully, if all goes well, be our first object to leave the Kerbin Sphere of Influence. Uh, we've got another attempt at the science buggy. Uh, last episode I went around trying to get some of the microbiomes, some of the biomes I wasn't as aware of in the past that are around the Kerbal Space Center. I'm going to try and see if I can scoop up the rest of those. And uh, finally, most exciting of all, um, in this, over the course of this video, we'll be making the jump from 1.04 to 1.05, which got released, uh, just last week, and, uh, some of the, mo the mods have finally had a chance to catch up, and I will be, um, uh, making the jump over. And for this mission right here, I mean, this is utterly routine, we're just gonna go into low orbit, uh, do what we need to do, and then get back down, I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Engine failure! Oh my gosh, the main engine just failed. Okay, okay, we can still save this mission. I mean, I'm at minus 300 kilometers uh, for the periapsis. Let's get the liquid fuel and oxidizer that's left in that main stage and get that into the orbiter. There we go, okay, stage. And fire that engine. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay, we are very close to our apoapsis. Oh, in fact, we just passed apoapsis. We're going down, that's not good, so pitch up. Throttle up and pitch up. Got a lot of fuel in this orbiter now, so we should be okay. Yeah, I had no hope once that main engine went. Once that main engine went, that uh, I, I had no way of fixing it. That I just had to do. If that happened earlier in the during the ascent part, uh, I would have had to abort the mission. But I think I can get this. Should be able to save this with the fuel that's still left in the orbiter. Oh, there we go. We're less than 100 km, negative 100 kilometers periapsis. Got to get the periapsis, of course, above 70 kilometers. Okay, here we go. Let's see. We're at minus 12 kilometers on the periapsis. Still 172 meters per second left in the vehicle. We got this. We got this. This is easy now. You have to make sure that I don't drain all the fuel and have these folks stuck in orbit. I don't want to have to end up rescuing them. Okay, we're now into the positives for the periapsis height. 
Oh, just over 50 kilometers, almost out of the atmosphere, just a little bit more. I'm going to stop just to 70. There we go. All right, we got an orbit. Contract, that contract requirement has gone green. I just have to get Tillium back down. That contract is settled. Still have 93 meters per second left in the vehicle. More than enough to get these folks back down. And in fact, yeah, we, we picked up the EVO, EVA over the North Polar Ice Cap, one of the easiest, probably the easiest biome, maybe next to water. It is the easiest biome to spot from space. And uh, the descent went without issue. Got these folks back down. And now it's time to move on. Now in space for over 26 days, awaiting for its transfer burn, the maneuver for which has annoyingly disappeared. That's kind of annoying, but we'll deal with that later. This is Duna 1, and if you recall last episode, I took the antenna on Duna 1 and pointed it towards uh, Eve, I think I did. Anyway, one of the inner planets to try and fulfill a contract, which I don't think is working because there is a four-day shakeout that the contract requires, and if you take a look at the time here, you'll see that the timer has just restarted. I don't know why. That's weird. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm going to abandon this contract with this particular one. i got to send out some more interplanetary relays anyway because I don't have anything that can communicate with this thing once it's outside of Kerbin's sphere of influence. So uh, that will have to be done later. But for now, I'm going to need to reset up this uh, this maneuver. That's uh, kind of annoying. Um, and you know what? Uh, several episodes ago when I first launched this thing, I spent quite a bit of time talking about how to set up the transfer, so I'm not going to talk about it really now. Instead, what we'll do is we'll just cut ahead to the burn itself. This vehicle actually has two stages. There's the uh, transfer stage, which is burning right now. And in that stage, there is a 1,084 meters per second of delta V in liquid fuel and oxidizer. And considering that this burn started at 1,043 meters per second, um, unless I completely botch it, uh, there should be some delta V left over. And in fact, there's also monoprop in there that's not even counted in this. So I'll probably end up taking that stage along with me. A uh, couple of things when doing these transfer burns I'll talk about right now is that um, sometimes I see people, you want to do these burns when you're really close to Kerbin in a low orbit. I'm now in an 80 kilometer orbit. Well, not anymore. I'm on my way out of here, but <laughs> I started this in an 80 kilometer orbit. Sometimes I see people, they want to put themselves into these big orbits out, I don't know, around Mimbus and stuff and think that's an efficient way to go. And it's like, no, it's not. It's actually most efficient to burn really close to the planet when you're going really fast. That's the O-Birth effect. Anyway, we're coming towards the end of our burn. We have escape velocity. I can now see my trajectory going out towards Duna. It's interesting that uh, getting to Duna is actually not that much more than escape velocity getting out of the Kerbin system. Getting out of the Kerbin system only takes about 950 meters per second, and this burn was less than 1,050 meters per second. Okay, just burning off the rest of this. Here we go, just about there. Let's take away that. That's it, we got our encounter. Awesome. Okay. You can see another burn there, by the way. It's about 7.6 meters per second. It's 119 days from now. That's a correction burn uh, that I'll worry about later <laughs> to tweak my encounter with Duna. And we are once again on the night side of Kerbin, completely unavoidable in this case. This always happens whenever you burn for a planet with an orbit that is outside of Kerbin's orbit um, because you have to burn so that your ejection angle is along the direction that Kerbin is going around the Sun in its orbit, which means you have to burn on the trailing edge of Kerbin, uh, which means you're burning at sunset, which means that your trajectory will carry you across the night side of Kerbin on your way out to, well, in this case, Duna. If you're going for Eve or Moho, it works completely the other way around. You burn around sunrise, and your trajectory takes you across the day side of Kerbin on your way towards one of those more inner planets. But anyway, we will revisit this probe in four days' time, a little bit later in this video, once it exits the Kerbin sphere of influence. Now, the Korion is only about two and a half hours away from its maneuver to attempt to rendezvous 
with Kerbin Station, but that gives us plenty of time to do another mission with uh, the science buggy here. So we got Luya out here in the science buggy, again scrounging up some science. You might recall from last episode that I learned for the first time that there are additional little biomes uh, in and around the Kerbal Space Center besides just the buildings themselves and I picked up a bunch of science around the flagpole uh, by the astronaut complex. I also picked up some extra science in the um, research and development center by, by nudging up to a particular building uh, and getting some science in a biome called the main building at the research and development center. Uh, and then, uh, well, I got myself stuck and I couldn't unstick the uh, science buggy, so I, I recovered it and called it a day. Well, now it's rebuilt, and we're trying this again. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> the outcome is much the same as it was last time. In fact, it's even worse because I was going around the research and development center, nudging up to buildings, trying to find some more biomes, and I kept running into just main building every single time, including this time. This, Although you see Materials Bay and Mystery Goo there, they're just the little slivers of science that's always kind of left over. I don't really have anything else. So I thought what I'd do is I'll get Louie out here and see if she can push. At least the door's not blocked this time. See if she can not push this thing out of here. Well, although she was able to push it out of here, once she stopped pushing, this particular vehicle just wanted to go right back into the same corner, no matter what I did. And I ended up doing a little bit of exploration with Luya, trying to see, are there any other biomes there? And I really couldn't find any. I think there are, you know, some listed, if you go on Google and try to find, there are some more biomes in around the Research and Development Center, but I really do think it needs to be fully upgraded before I can get any more out of it. So, yeah, it ended up always going right back into this corner again. So, yeah, I, I really got to put a reverse on this thing. But I decided to recover it. No science really being uh, uh, gathered to speak of. So this was really kind of a waste of time. But, uh, it, again, no real uh, money lost. Uh, recovered pretty close to 100% of its value. Only take a day or so to rebuild it, and then we'll try this again. And that brings us to Val and Glafia and Chrissy in the Karayan, where we left them last episode, except now they are approaching that rendezvous burn to get them back to Kerbin Station. And just to remind people, they have a whole 11 meters per second of delta V left in the liquid fuel and oxidizer to do this 22.4 meter per second burn, not to mention to match velocities on the other side. But they do have over 80% of the 285 units of monopropellant. And I've decided to do this part of the burn uh, with just using the monopropellant. I'm leaving the LFO, the main engines, for if I need them to really slow these down quickly as I approach the uh, station. So this is just going to be with monopropellant. I have no idea how long this burn is going to take. That's a, kind of a downside of all of this. But so I'll do a little bit of a test burn here. I'm now under a minute to the maneuver. Okay. Well, that, 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 that went down a little more quickly than I thought it would. So I think what I'll do... I think I'll go for 25 seconds to be the start of my burn. We'll see how that goes. So there we go, 25 seconds, start the burn. Yeah, that's, that's, this is going all right. I think it's going all right. And in fact, when I finished it all off, I ended up with a closest approach of 0.2 kilometers and still 205 of the 285 units of monoprop still remaining. Taking a look at these two orbits, uh, you know, my orbit's there in blue, or the Karayan's orbit, and my target orbit is there in yellow. Uh, they look like they have pretty close to the same semi-major axis. In other words, their average altitude's about the same. But you can see there's... I'm going to have to be doing quite a bit of radial burning <laughs> when these two guys come together. And radial burning is uh, some of the least efficient of your types of burnings when you burn radially to your orbit. So, uh, yeah, might be an expensive burn on the other side. Yeah, as anticipated, I got, uh, right now, just under 170 meters per second of relative velocity to kill off. It is dropping, but I am getting close. I'm just about three minutes from the station, so I'd best start burning, because I don't have a lot of thrust burning. I don't know, expelling? What do you call monoprop? 
not really burning anything. But anyway, you know what I mean. Um, and as you're doing this, you want to watch um, not only your closest approach distance, but also your time. Uh, because the thrust is so low, if that, you know, if that time starts dropping quickly, here you can see it's 3.09, 3 minutes and 8 seconds. So it's dropping very, very slowly. So I'm very comfortable still doing this with monopropellant. If it was dropping really quickly, that's what I'm saving that 11 meters per second of liquid fuel and oxidizer for so I can neutralize speed quickly. But now I can still take my time. And as I'm doing this, noticing that I'm not putting my ship onto the retrograde icon, not try, or not trying to herd that retrograde icon onto the target icon because I'm still a good distance away, uh, the retrograde icon actually has a tendency to drop towards the horizon when you're doing maneuvers. Um, so sort of anticipate that, right? Uh, if you if you herd it onto the target icon now, you'll just find that it'll move off as you get closer. So, you know, I'm watching my distance, watching the nav ball, but no, feeling pretty good. In fact, it was quite a bit less difficult than I anticipated it was going to be. I mean, here I am, I'm under 600 meters now from the station, relative velocity is down to 18.3 meters per second, and still 76 uh, units of the monoprop left. And in fact, I think what I will do is start to use some of that liquid fuel and oxidizer for the first time, bring down my relative velocity even a little bit more. I don't want to leave, there's, there's no reason to be risky. Yeah, all it turned out, I just needed to take my time. That's all it was. It was easy. It really kind of just shows you what you can do with uh, limited degrees of thrust. You don't need a lot of thrust for most of the things that you do in space. But anyway, after this, it was pretty easy to bring the Karayan in and park it alongside. I'm not going to take the lander and the ship apart to, in order to dock it. I'm just going to park it up alongside, and uh, Glafia is just going to go out connect it with some pipes and then it's time to start thinking about getting some of these folks back down we'll leave valentina and bob on the station bob has been on the station mining the station this whole time uh and they're going to go on to the next mission for the crime which is going to be to take the kegel lander and go to minmus and repeat the mission that was basically done on the moon but this time on minmus you won't be seeing that this episode but it will be in a episodes soon to come and then we're going to take Lafia and Chrissy down to uh down to the surface and oh geez Chrissy almost forgetting all the science oh my goodness the science is still on the Karayan so Chrissy get on over there and uh collect all of that science geez that would have been bad <laughs> So with that sorted, we'll get these two and their boatload of science down. And then we'll have to bring up uh, another engineer to replace Clefia. And to be honest, I almost, uh, I really thought of having Glafia, uh do the Minmus mission as well. In fact, it would have put her to level two if I if I put her into orbit around Minmus. That would have put her to level two. So that was really, really tempting. She'd never been to Minmus before, but... This actually, Mark, this is her 48th day in space. She was part, her and Jeb were the first crew of the Karayan. That was quite a lot of episodes ago that I first put them up into space. Jeb's already down on the surface, and sorry, 48 days, that's long enough. It's time to get her down. We'll bring up a couple of more engineers. Actually, yeah, two more engineers, because um, uh, I need one engineer to go to Minmus. But I'm going to need another engineer to remain on the station, and that's because this station is, you think it's a mess right now, wait till you see a little later in this episode what it looks like. <laughs> it really needs a docking hub, and I've had a docking hub in the building queue along with um, uh, containers containing all other kinds of cool stuff, including these uh, KAS struts that I can you, uh, use while EVAing to strut things together. Um, all of that stuff has been has been in the building queue, and it's been in the building queue forever. But looking at the numbers, I think it will be ready um, before uh, the crew is back from Minmus. So uh, I want an engineer on the station to help uh, put all that kind of stuff together. But all that's going to have to be for the future, because right now, it's science time. Yes, and that mission scored me 448 science, bringing me up to a total of 490 science, which is enough for me to unlock three new nodes. Well, two nodes if I wanted to go for the tier 7, but instead I decided to go for three 
tier six nodes and my emphasis was going to be on bigger and better so I got finally command modules so a whole slew of command modules coming with this including uh, the, the three-man command module and a whole and a whole bunch of really cool uh, homegrown rockets modules I went with heavier rockets to give me that mainsail engine and the really useful big liquid fuel boosters so I'll be able to get heavier payloads into space and finally I went with advanced exploration extendable ladders finally uh, the lab module as well as a really cool homegrown rockets orbital module and multi the multi-spectral analyzer from scansat um, that allows me to scan for biomes so as you can see from these it's going to take uh, a few days for these to unlock but once they do bigger and better things are coming so we'll skip ahead a day to another launch of the Cursed Stock 5 that you've seen so many times from the outside. I thought it was time to look at it from the inside once again. And this Cursed Stock is containing our two engineers uh, that are going up to replace the crew that just came back down. Uh, you are watching this through the eyes of Bartner, and to his left is Bill. Yes, two male engineers in a confined capsule. Oh, you know how this is going to go. Let the farting competition begin. And before you think you can't have a farting competition in spacesuits, oh, engineers, they are problem solvers. And uh, all you need to do is modify the rules of the game a little bit. The winner is not determined until they are in a stable orbit and take their helmets off. I'll leave that for you to think about. But anyway, um, let's see here. Yes, they are replacing... Um, two people that just came down and one of these is going to go to Minmus and I ummed an odd back and forth between whether it should be Bartner or Bill to go to Minmus. Um, Bill is only one experience point away from going to level two. Now he has already been to Minmus before but that was to do a flyby. This time he would be put into orbit around Minmus. That would earn him that one extra point and uh, that would put him to level two. Bartner has never gone anywhere outside of low carbon orbit um, there's Bill. Hi, Bill. Oh, Bill doesn't look too impressed. Oh, well. <laughs> Maybe he just let a really good one go. Anyway, um, Bartner has never been out of low curve in orbit, but, so when he goes to Minmus, he would gain the full four experience points for orbiting Minmus, um, but that would not be enough to put him up to level two. So... I decided to go with Bartner, just to maximize the experience points. I thought, you know what, each time let's think about maximizing the amount of experience earned, and later on everything else will come out in the wash. So, Bartner's going to Minmus, Bill is going to stay on the station, uh, but that is going to have to be for uh, a future episode. That's because the Karayan uh, does not have enough fuel to do the whole while, well, obviously. You saw it coming in here. It doesn't have nearly enough fuel, and there's not enough fuel on the station to refuel it. So I'm going to have to bring up another fuel barge that is in the building queue and will be up here soon, but uh, not in this episode. So what we're going to do is we're just going to uh, dock our engineers. And uh, don't worry, uh, Bob and Val have been advised to retreat to the isolation of the Karayan before that airlock is opened. And... Uh, we're just, we're just going to finish that off and then get on to something, well, at least for me, is pretty exciting. Dun, dun, dun! It's 1.05. I got the upgrade. I got my mods working. Well, most of them anyway. And before we look at this really cute little cockpit, I want to take note of the monoprop thrusters that are at the front. That is for reversing. Yay. Ooh, nice little cockpit. Hmm, these don't seem to work. Docking mode. Oh, uh, maybe they work in space. No raster prop monitor stuff. Doesn't really look like there'd be enough room. Really nice little tight little cockpit, though. Yeah, obviously this is the new Mark I cockpit. Looks really sweet. It makes me want to go back and build little planes again. And I got this engine on the back now, and the uh, air intake has changed. I've actually did nothing in the build other than to put on these uh, monoprop engines, um, the little monoprop thrusters, which I did before I went to 1.05, so I did nothing to modify this, so it, that's why it looks a little bit goofy. But you know what the mission is going to be. Uh, I've given up trying to get any more microbiomes out of the research and development area uh, center. 
I think I need to upgrade that fully before I can get anything more. So what I'm heading for here is the space plane hangar. And I'm going to nudge up next to the hangar and... Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's put the brakes on. There we go. Brakes on. And start collecting science. This is the space plane hangar main building. So we'll scoop all this stuff up. Excellent. And of course, what we're going to do is we're going to EVA. We'll collect it all up. We'll also collect some EVA reports in a surface sample. So EVA. Oh, shoot. Hatch is blocked. Hatch is obstructed. Cannot exit. Oh, is the hatch on the top? Is all this crap on the top blocking the hatch? I don't know where the hatch is on the new cockpit. Oh, shoot. Okay, so we'll have to back out of here. That's no big deal, because I'm prepared. So the first thing we got to do is shut down this engine. And then we'll turn on the monoprop engines. And wait a second. There is a reverse thrust. There's a reverse thrust option. Well, reverse thrust. Let's see how that works. So reverse thrust. We'll thrust up. And we don't seem to be backing up. And I'm hoping some of you are having a very good laugh at me right now. At the time, I was completely confused why I wasn't backing up. But if you take a look at the top, my brakes are very solidly on right now. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> I didn't realize that. And uh, I went to the monoprop and tried it with the monoprop. And that made no difference. I still couldn't back up. And if you're asking right now, are you the kind of guy that drives out of his driveway with the handbrake still on? The answer to that question is yes, I am that kind of guy. So, so uh, yeah, I never figured this out, at least, well, not until now. And so I ended up just recovering and trying it again. <laughs> and, you know, I think that try again is going to have to wait until the next episode. Yeah, this is kind of a sad place to end this at. But uh, this, this episode's getting a little bit long, so we'll, we'll see the science buggy again next episode. We'll see the Karayan get outfitted for its trip to Minmus. We will see Duna 1 again as it leaves the Kerbin Sphere of Influence, and I'm sure other stuff as well. But in the meantime, I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.